Well, good morning, White Flag. I trust that you have been blessed thus far in our time of worship and that you are ready to dive into God's Word. And I just want to welcome all of you that are visiting with us for the very first time and want to welcome everyone that's joining us online from wherever you're watching. We are glad that you're here and we are excited to be in a series called Killing Ugly. This series is called Killing Ugly and let me tell you what it's all about. It's about the fruit of the Spirit that God develops in us. And God does the developing of the fruit of, spirit, uh, fruit of the Spirit in us, and we do the killing of the ugly. We are to crucify the flesh. What that's all about is, is simply this battle that goes on in, in our lives as we give our lives to Jesus, and He is turning us into this new creation. We still live in these earthly bodies on this earth with sin all around us, in us, and we've got this battle that's going on. And so this series is all about how do we walk with the Spirit and allow the Spirit to, to dump in us the fruit, the fruit. And it's a package deal. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul describes it, and that's what this series is all about. We've been walking through all the descriptive words that Paul used to describe the, the fruit of the Spirit, but we've been emphasizing that it is a package deal, that it all comes. It's not one little piece of this or one little piece of that. It's all these things. And so let's understand all these different caveats. And so, so far we've talked about love and we've talked about joy. Well, today we're going to talk about peace. We're going to talk about peace. And it's perfect timing because uh, President Trump just recently uh, released a, a Middle East peace plan I don't know if you've heard about that, and, and it is, by the way, okay to be uh, thankful and excited for something that's good, even if Trump touched it, if you happen to be a Trump hater. It is okay to be excited that there's a plan uh, for, for Israel. And by the way, Israel's pretty excited about it. Uh, let me give you a quote uh, from Benjamin Netanyahu, who's the prime minister of Israel. Here's what he said. I think the president has done something extraordinary. President Trump has brought forward a peace plan that enables us to make the deal of a century. It gives Israel security. It gives the Palestinians national dignity. And it allows us to move forward so that we can live together. So I'm very excited that, that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's excited about this. I'm, I'm excited that there's some kind of plan. Uh, but if I'm honest with you, I, I would say, yeah, there's a plan, but I don't know that it's going to make a lot of difference. And here, here's the reason I say that. Because it seems like nothing's ever made much of a difference in that region of the world right? And, and I wonder, you know, does the peace plan written, you know, does that like magically fix things? Because has anybody read the peace plan in here? I'm betting not one of you have. I tried. Has, did anyone try to read the peace plan? Because it's like 580 plus pages. And, and so, by the way, when you hear news reporters talk about it, I'll bet you money they haven't read it either. I tried. It's so boring. I couldn't get through like three paragraphs. So I, so I just counted how many pages. I was like, good gracious, I'm not reading this. So who's going to read that and it's going to magically change everything? But I think we should be thankful for it. It's just we need to recognize, you know, it's pretty hard to pull off peace in the Middle East. But everybody wants it, right? Everybody wants not just peace in the Middle East, but peace everywhere, world peace. You know, uh, I've been to Israel, and let me show you what, what peace looks like. Uh, this is a picture I took when I, I was walking. This was actually uh, in Bethlehem. I was in Bethlehem, and this is just at one corner of the street. And there were all these uh, signs that's like, you know, don't take picture of security. I did anyway, but I wanted to, and, and I took one more picture. The next one is just, a, you know, established that I was there a little quick selfie and then it's like okay now we're out of here um, but then this third picture I was in Jericho which is weird right so I was in Jericho you know walking around we were having lunch and I snuck out uh, while everybody was having lunch and I, I like to just kind of roam the streets and go up to people and uh, you know I always carry candy this sounds terrible but I carry candy with me and I'm always like hey you want some candy because it you know kids like candy and I'm not going to do anything. I'm not talking about that kind of bad stuff. It's just 
you know, in a foreign country, candy speaks a language of, hey, you know. So I'm talking to this kid, and uh, they're riding their bikes, and I was riding his bike, which was fun to ride a bike around in the, you know, streets of Jericho. And, and he thought that was cool, and so he wanted a picture, and we took a picture and we, didn't, we couldn't even speak the same language. When we take the picture, the selfie, we both throw up the same thing, a peace sign, right? So, you know, I'm, you know, I think that's just like, I don't know what to do with my hands, so hey, you know, that's what we do. But maybe he means something else, but he knew what that meant. And so, you know, this culture, it's interesting. Um, they've never experienced peace, ever. Do you, do you know what the name Jerusalem of the city of Jerusalem, do you know what Jerusalem means? You could guess. It means peace. It means the city of peace. And yet uh, there was no peace. In fact, while I was there, uh, the day I was there was the day that Trump moved the Capitol, which that was real fun, right? They had to get us out of the city because there were riots everywhere. And so this is not a place that really understands or has ever experienced peace. And yet they want it. And I am really seriously enthusiastic about this peace plan I just sometimes the cynical side of me says is it ever going to really happen when it involves people and that's the reality that we need to understand is that world peace is a pipe dream I've told you that before but if you think there's this concept or idea or possibility for world peace you're ignoring scripture Jesus himself in Matthew um, says look there are there's going to be wars and rumors of wars that's a quote wars and rumors of wars all the way up until his second coming like the only thing that's ever going to bring world peace is Jesus and his second coming there's not going to be something figured out between now and then and we need to just understand that the reality is this if we all worked on a personal peace plan if we all worked on a personal peace plan we could actually see some real change because it would be something that impacts us and something that we impact it would be something that we have somewhat control on and so this is where we should start not with this like ethereal idea of I want world peace we we should work on peace in our own lives peace with the people that we interact with and so let me give you a foundational verse for today as we begin this topic of peace this caveat of the fruit of the spirit the passage is psalm 34 14 and it encapsulates exactly what we need to be doing and here's what it says turn from evil and do good seek peace and pursue it very easy verse right turn from evil and do good part one part two seek peace and pursue it now this fits nice and tidy right into our series title and our series concept of killing ugly turn from evil turn from evil what does that mean that means kill the ugly That means attack the sin in your life. Turn from it. Don't have anything to do with it. Turn from evil and do good. And then seek peace and pursue it. Well, that sounds a lot like, hey, go be with Jesus, the Father, the Son, right? Go be with the Holy Spirit. I've been saying that time and time again in this series. Go to the source of power that can actually change you, that can produce this fruit in you seek peace well guess what jesus has another name you know what that name is the prince of peace so you need to seek jesus you can't pursue peace without pursuing jesus that's the first foundational thing you need to understand today you can't pursue peace without pursuing jesus people try all kinds of things they try to find peace in in yoga they try to find peace in nature They try to find peace in Buddhism. Shoot, people even try to find peace in simply getting along with everyone, just having no conflict, and they they think that will give them peace. But these are all just little slices of peace, little slivers of peace, but they're not true peace. True peace can only be found in Jesus. Amen? Now, some of you are like, amen, and some of you are like, I I don't know what that means. What, what, What are you talking about? 
How exactly do you pull that off? How does this work? What does this look like? Well, I am glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you. I was inspired by the Middle East peace plan, and I decided to write a shorter version. And it was an individual peace plan. So I've got a three-part peace plan for you, all right? So my my attempt to write a three-part peace plan in less than 580-something pages for you that I can present to you in the next, you know, 25 minutes. And so... I'm hoping that you'll write this down and I'm hoping you understand the domino effect of each one of these in your life. And so let's begin with step one. Step one of the plan for you is squash your beef with God. That's step one. Squash your beef with God. This step is all about making peace with God. Now some of you need an explanation of what squash the beef means. <laughs> you know, I was going over this and my wife was like, what does squash the beef mean? What are you talking about? I'm like, you don't know what squash a beef means? And so, you know, we had this big long debate. I'm like, no, it's a pretty common phrase. So how many of you know what squash and the beef means? Raise your hand. Okay, that's what I thought. So I told Julie last night, see, I was right again. But anyway, um, <laughs> no. But I understand some of you are like, no, I don't, the eight. I don't get that slang. I don't get that lingo. So let's make sure we're all on the same page. It's, it's really simple. Squashing a beef is, is slang for getting together with a person that you've got conflict with and working it out, right? It, it, it's slang for, you know, we're going to sit down and we're going to hash this out so that we can walk out of here, not at odds, but on the same page. That, that's what squashing a beef means. And so squash your beef with God. Well, what's the beef? Well, the beef is this, sin. Sin creates conflict between you and God, between me and God. Sin is a problem. And the big problem is we don't have the ability in our own power to squash that sin, to deal with that sin, to to, to, you know, say, I'll take care of this problem. We don't have the ability to do that. See, we started a fight with God, but God finishes the fight with Jesus. We start the fight, but God finishes the fight. So there's this conflict. There's a holy God, and then there is humans who have been born into a sinful world with the propensity to sin. That means with this real gift to consistently do one thing in our lives, and that is to break the rules, break the law, do things that are offensive to God, to sin. That that conflict is created because God can't have anything to do with something that's impure, unrighteous, and unholy. He's perfect, and he can't be in association with anything that's not. Well, that's a problem. That's a problem. And so here's how God dealt with that problem in Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 through 22 Paul writes this and it will be up on the screen for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him who's the him in Jesus so this gets a little bit confusing so I might put in the name Jesus where it says him or God where it says him because there's a lot of hymns in this Uh, particular verse and it's pretty deep for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus reconcile to himself God all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through Jesus's blood shed on the cross and that's that's deep but this is foundational to anyone coming to faith God saw a solution to the problem. The problem of sin in us, his his creation, and being able to relate to him and be in proximity to him and be in relationship with him. He thought, you know what? I'll take my son and I'll send my son and my son will fix this on the cross. He, he He will make peace. How How does he make peace on the cross? Well, it says in the next verse, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. 
We were living by the flesh, doing whatever we want. But now, Jesus has reconciled you, or God has reconciled you. That's he, he, he is God there. God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That's a lot. Here is what this is saying. The way that God made peace, you see, it all centers on judgment. God is a just God. When a, when a sin is committed, when a foul is committed, when a rule is broken, there has to be justice because God is perfect and holy and righteous. And so we've committed sin, there has to be a payment. So God doesn't just go, I forgive everybody because that would be unjust. Somebody has to pay. And what's so remarkable is Jesus volunteered and he comes and he dies on the cross and he says, I'm going to pay the penalty for the sins of mankind. And by doing that, he creates peace. Now there's a way for God to not have conflict with you because the offense has been paid for. Oh, and by the way, you have been washed clean. You've been made perfect. So it's not just a, a forgiving of what you've done in the past, but you have been made blemish free. You, you have been made free of accusation. That means there can be no charge brought against you because the payment has already been paid. This is what God has done to squash the beef, the conflict with us. But, but here's the kicker. God made the first move and took care of that, but we've got to squash our beef with God because we do have a beef with God. You know what the natural beef with God is from a human perspective? We like to be in control of our own lives. We like to call all the shots we don't want to hand over the reins to God. And so, so while God makes the first move and has made a way where there's no conflict on his end, we've got to receive that and allow him to be in our lives and to lead our lives. And so a lot of people struggle with this. We call it surrender. In fact, this is why we named our church White Flag. If you're new to our church and you ever wondered why that's the name, this name is centered on this very concept that, that by nature we are at war with God because we live by the flesh. We want to make our own decisions and it's an offense to God and we battle for control and until like in war when you realize you're defeated, you know, a person waves their white flag until you wave your white flag and admit that you are not God and that you can't win and that you need him and that you need his son in your life, you will never experience forgiveness, grace, and transformation. And so that's why we call our church white flag. A lot of people struggle with that part of it, but if if you want to have peace in your life, I mean, the, the first step is to squash your beef with God. And thank goodness, he squashed his beef with us through Jesus. Amen? Now, that's the first domino. Nothing works without that first. You can't have peace in any area of your life if you don't first establish peace with God. And you don't receive the peace of God. Now, step two. Step two of the peace plan you got to squash your inner Liam Neeson. Some of you are like, I, I don't know who Liam Neeson is. I'm just, you, you, I'll, I'll introduce you to him in a second. got to squash your inner Liam Neeson. This step is all about making peace with other people. Other people are going to do you wrong. Other people are going to hurt you. Other people are going to betray you. Other people are going to take advantage of you. And there is going to be something in you that wants to respond in this manner. Meet Liam Neeson. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you are looking for a ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, 
I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. Some of you are like, I just wish I could have that conversation with somebody. <laughs> hey, listen, boss, I, I, I'm late again to work, but, but I have developed a special set of skills. <laughs> and if you don't start treating me better, <laughs> I will find you. And I will, yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 uh, there is a natural response to want to get even to want to get revenge, to want to respond and end up on top, right? To sort things out your way. And, and it's, you know, I, I feel like it's a channeling of, you know, the inner Liam Neeson and all of us that we have got to fight. And scripture speaks to this. Paul in particular talks about this time and time again. You know, after we receive peace from God because of Jesus, you know, we've got to realize there are people that we interact with that we've got to extend that peace to, even the people that we don't like. Now listen to what it says in Romans. Paul writes in chapter 12, verses 17 through 19. It will be up on the screen. Paul writes this. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you... Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So this passage is pretty straightforward. It's not complicated to understand. Paul is saying, look, you know, don't put yourself in the position of judge and jury. That's God's role. Your role is to live a life of peace. Peace was established for you by Jesus. And you're experiencing peace as a gift when you don't deserve it. You created the conflict. He had to squash it, right? Now, as you interact with other people, whatever conflict emerges, well, try to avoid conflict. But as you are in conflict, man, you can't take revenge. And you've got to work. And notice this line. If it's possible... If it's possible, as far as it depends on you. Why is that line in there? Because it is not possible to live at peace with everyone. Because some people, some people just want to live in conflict. Some people just want to have a beef. Some people just will not sit down at the table and have a conversation. And you cannot kill yourself to force peace with that person. But as far as it depends on you, if, 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 it, if it's possible by your doing something or you're responding in a certain way, you need to pursue peace. Now, Paul talks about it again in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. He writes this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. Paraphrase. It's like, hey, since we're one body of believers, this is a church, it's called White Flag, and we're all a part of this. We're brothers and sisters. There should not be conflict between any of us in this room. In fact, kind of the rule of thumb is let the peace of Christ rule rule in our hearts and our lives and the way that we interact oh that what, what's the rule of of the peace of christ how, how do we let that rule well it seems like it would be that we would approach every situation every potential conflict every disagreement every misunderstanding with what grace rather than judgment and that needs to kind of be the kind of the natural thing that bubbles up out of you. This is the fruit that God wants to produce in your life. That your natural response would be responding with the, the, the rule of the peace of Christ. Now, Hebrews, which we don't know, uh, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But uh, in chapter 12, verse 14, there's one more kind of little uh, encouragement here. Make every effort to live in peace. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So, so this is not a casual thing. We've talked about this tension all throughout the series about how God develops the fruit in us. But that doesn't mean we make no effort. We have clear direction here that we should be 
as far as it depends on us, making every effort in every way with everyone to live at peace. And when you do that, not only are you going to make a difference in your, you're going to experience something different emotionally and stress-wise and mentally and spiritually, but so is the people in your life, right? So it, it, this is a domino effect. We receive this peace from Christ and it establishes something for us for all of eternity and then that impacts the way we live with the people around us. Now, the third and final step of this peace plan. You got to squash the panic button in your head. You got to squash the panic button in your head. This step is all about having peace within when life gets crazy. When everything turns upside down. And I'm and I'm not talking just, you know, a zen escape right? I'm not, I'm not just talking about a moment of, you know, everything's going crazy around you and you kind of just numb it all out by going, hum. That's as limber as I am. And then, oh, I feel so much better. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say squash the panic button in your head, I'm talking about establishing a real understanding of truth that grounds you when life gets turbulent, when everything goes nuts and chaotic and crazy. I'm talking about having a sense of not panicking and hitting the panic button when everything around you is crashing, right? I'm talking about living in such a way that, that as life is, is, is moving you and tossing you and turning you, that you have an ability to maintain a calmness and a peace based on truth. Kind of like, you remember when Jesus was on, uh, the, in, on the Sea of Galilee and, and I've told the story about the waves coming up over the boat, you know, and, and all the disciples are, you know, like very experienced fishermen. They're very experienced on this lake uh, and yet they are panicking. And, and all the while, what is Jesus doing on the boat? He's asleep. He, he, he doesn't have a care in the world, right? You say, well, yeah, because he's Jesus. Okay, I'll give you that. Um, but there's also something he's aware of. Nothing is going to happen to me that my father doesn't want to happen to me. I'm here on a mission that he has asked me to, to carry out, and he'll allow me to carry it out. So he's asleep, and they come to him, and they're like, oh, wait, oh, wait, we're going to die. And he's like, what? I mean, he, you know, he, he can't believe it. Like, how do you not get it by now? How do you have such little faith? And then he's like, peace, be still, and the waves just all calm down. And, and that's, that's the kind of peace I'm talking about. How do we have, you know, this peace in our lives when life is so crazy and chaotic? And how do we not, like, just panic with every new emergency and every new shocking thing that, that we have to figure out? You see... A real understanding of truth that grounds you is to understand that Jesus doesn't promise to eliminate chaos, but offers peace through it. That, that's the key, is to understand he's not going to just take this all away, right? And so that you don't have any problems. He, he is going to offer you something substantial enough that allows you to go through anything this world throws at you. Let me read to you some things that Jesus said in scripture about his peace. John chapter 14 verse 27. Peace I leave you, Jesus says. My peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This again is reminding us this is not a peace that we go and manufacture. This is a peace that is deposited into us as a fruit from the Spirit. Then look at John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me 
because that's the only place you're going to find it, in me you may have peace. Look, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the passage that you should always challenge anyone that's trying to preach to you or teach you health and wealth, prosperity, gospel. This idea that God wants everything to be perfect in your life and if you sow the seed, all your problems will go away. If you just believe and have faith, God just is gonna bless you and bless you with all these great things and life's gonna be perfect for you. You'll be healthy and wealthy and wise. That's just not true. Jesus said, no, no, no. Life's gonna suck, man. It's gonna suck big time. The whole time you live it, that's what he's saying. You're gonna have trouble, but take heart. This isn't the end of the story. You might have to experience, you know, that's why there are people, that, that little kids that have cancer because life sucks sometimes. You know, I, uh, that's a side note. I, I got a call a couple of months ago from someone who has a friend who has a kid who's got like you know a, a, a disease and is going to die and and the you know the the church leaders around this kid and the kid was like nine is is telling the kid you're not being healed yet because you don't have enough faith and I just want to you know boom those people right with peace I mean in, in a spirit of peace <laughs> I want to Liam Neese in their throats, right? I ought to call, I ought to start calling these health and, hey, health and wealth guy, I've got a special set of skills. <laughs> I will find you and I will lead you to Jesus. Yeah, all right. Anyway, sorry, that was a rabbit trail. See, I told myself don't go there and then I went there and now I have no idea where I'm at in this message. But that, you know, that verse that Jesus is talking about or that verse where Jesus is talking, he's saying, look, man, you're gonna have trouble in this world because this world is not your home and it's full of sin and you're here temporarily, you know, until we get you to heaven. And so we can understand that bad stuff's gonna happen. That has nothing to do with our faith. It has everything to do with how this world works, but we can have a faith that transcends all of that and we can have a peace that, that just doesn't make sense but is given to us by God and I you say really doesn't make sense yeah that's the next verse that I want to read to you this one's from Paul Paul says it's all on the same topic Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 through 7 do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. I can't explain it, nobody can. It's a fruit deposited into us by God. We'll guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say, take all your requests and your prayers you know, and present them to God and he's gonna fix everything so you're perfect and you're whole on this earth, physically. But man, you can be perfect and whole spiritually and you can be prepared and grow and have a calmness and a peace and an understanding of how this works because God has enlightened you with a fruit that brings peace into your heart and your soul, which is a game changer with how we live our lives because, listen, you're not supposed to ignore or pretend that the chaos all around you isn't there, like mind over matter, peace comes from knowing that Jesus is holding on to you every step of the way no matter what is going on in this life and this is not the end that is different than just mind over matter and when other people watch this in your life I told you it's a domino effect everything starts with you gotta you gotta make peace with God and only after you make peace with God would you ever live in a space where you're making peace with everyone in your lives. And then it moves over to, wait a minute, I can have peace through all different kinds of circumstances, not with people, but what's with people and with circumstances. And when you start to live this way, other people that watch you, now all of a sudden, God, in, in the mystery of his brilliance, he knows that now you're going to be a light to a bunch of people who are going Panic button, panic button, panic button. 
they're hitting the panic button. They're also stressed out about all the peace that they don't have and lack of peace that, that they're experiencing with relationships, not to mention they are going to be separated from God for eternity because they've not made peace with God. They're a hot mess and they're all around you. And when you start to live by a peace plan, man, people will look at you and go, how, how, are, how are you managing through this news that you just received? How are you dealing with this with such grace? How are you so full of grace and so forgiving? How is it that, that you have a love for people even when they mistreat you? And how is it? And they'll start to observe you and they'll want a peace of that peace. And they might ask you a question and that light that's been shining from your life might impact the person around you that leads them to experience their own peace with God. See how it's all a big circular part of God's plan. And so, I leave you with the challenge to begin this peace plan. Everybody might be at a different state, right? Some of you might have already squashed the beef with God. You've waved your white flag, but you, you, you got some issues with people. Or some of you might be, no, done all those things and I'm just still not able to trust when everything around me is crashing. Right now, I feel like hitting the panic button. But some of you may have never, ever come to the conclusion, that first domino, that you're not God. And you've been warring against God. And you say, well, that's a strong word. Listen, that's not a strong word. If you are considering yourself the one in control and not allowing God to have the reins of your life, I, I, there's not any more audacious move than that, than, than to say to the person that created you and gave you life and gave you every ability that you have and knows every hair on your head to say, I'm gonna stiff arm you out of my life and I'm gonna be making the shots. That's, that's a war. And you need to put your weapons down and you need to recognize God's not against you, he's for you. And you need to wave your white flag and surrender and say, I'm not God and you are and I need to be saved from my sins. And until you do that, none of this other stuff makes any difference. And you can do that today. All you have to do is cry out to the Lord. You say, well, I don't wanna cry. Okay, then talk to the Lord, right? In your mind, however you wanna do it, you have to say, God, I get it. I'm lost, I'm dead in my sins and I need a savior. Will you come into my life and save me? You can say any form of that, anything that acknowledges you're not God, that he is, that you've got a sin problem, and that's good with God. And your life can change in an instant. And you'll receive the peace of Christ. And then you'll receive the fruit of the Spirit. And God will start producing this fruit in you, and it will start impacting your relationships and your circumstances. And that's what he's doing in all of us. If we do one thing, we go be with the Father. Go be with the Son. Go be with the Spirit. Because we can't receive this power any other way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and for this time today and for your patience and for your gift and for your grace and for your peace. We love you, Father. You deserve all of our worship. You deserve um, all of our attention, all of our focus. And we are so guilty of, of just ignoring you and marginalizing you and using you uh, whenever we need something. But Father, I just pray that you would know that I think at the heart of all of us, we, we want you to invade our lives and we don't even know how to really pull that off. And so in our weakness and our feeble attempts, we come to you today and say, please do something in our lives. Please deposit your fruit in us, develop it in us. We know we can't pull this off on our own. And so we just cry out to you to, to just pour into us and we're ready to receive it. And we just thank you for this time that we've had to be able to talk about peace and we, and we just pray that people will begin to see it in our lives. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done. It's in your son's name that we pray. Everybody says, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great weekend.